Can COVID is an open science collective dedicated to rapidly mobilizing and sharing knowledge to help inform Canada's COVID-19 response. To learn more about us or how to join our community, you can visit our website at cancovid.ca. Okay, welcome everyone, and uh, thank you for joining uh, this edition of Can COVID Speaker Series. My name is Rosa Stolteri, and I lead the research and evaluations team here at Can COVID. And I have the great pleasure of introducing you to this week's speaker, Dr. Stephen Freeman, Professor of Child Health and Wellness and Professor of Pediatrics and Emergency Medicine at the Cumming School of Medicine at the University of Calgary. Our title for today is Pediatric COVID-19, Children Are Not Just Little Adults. And so just a few things to note before we start, we have saved time at the end of today's presentation for a Q&A session. So please do enter your questions into the events chat um, and make sure that you select to everyone when you are entering in your question. And finally, we do have a brief introduction that we will, we will share right at the end. So without further ado, I will hand over the mic virtually to Dr. Freeman, thanks. Great, thank you very much for that introduction and uh, thank you everyone for joining this afternoon. Um, so my two main objectives really today are just to give a little bit of a description of the epidemiology of SARS-CoV-2 infection in Canadian children. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, a multinational study that I've been leading with several colleagues um, and focusing on two different sub-studies that we're currently working on, which are really looking at predictors of severe infections and outcomes in children, as well as the post-COVID condition, which has been a well-researched and a hot topic in the adult world where we're starting to learn more about how it affects children as well. So I believe in the chat box, um, there are, there's a hyperlink to this polev.com website. If you go there or text that mess to uh, text to Stephen Freed 091 uh, to, at the number 37607, it'll bring you to a polling app that I'm just gonna actually ask three quick questions. And I'm just curious as to thoughts and it gives me a little bit perhaps a lay of the land uh, for today's audience. So the first question, um, is what proportion of children hospitalized in Canada with COVID-19 are admitted to an intensive care unit? And I, I don't have a sense of how many people, actually, Rosa, or can you tell me how many are logged in? Oh, Scythe 78, so good. That gives me a sense of how many to wait for. So just starting to stabilize there. It looks like still a little bit of movement. So one in 5%, oh, slowly creeping up. 5% seems to be kind of the leading guess at the moment with 1% uh, with very few thinking more. Um, I'm gonna go to the next slide in the interest of time. What proportion of children admitted with COVID-19 to an ICU in Canada has died? So what's the risk of death if you are a child admitted to an ICU with COVID-19 in Canada? And I apologize, one of the downsides of this app is it doesn't tell you how many respondents you have. So the breadth of the numbers here are from one to 10. And it seems like most people are thinking 1% with a little bit of three and 5%. And then my last question is about you, the audience. Have you had any of the following symptoms in the last week of fatigue, headache, difficulty concentrating, forgetting to do something at home, abdominal pain or cough? So it looks like we're at about a two third, one third split with about two thirds of people having some of these symptoms in the last week. Don't, don't worry, we're all, we're all pretty normal people if you have those symptoms, so not shocking. So 65% seems to be where we've settled. I'll come back to that in a little bit. So I'm gonna give you some data now. So the first thing to know about children and COVID-19 in Canada is that 
children, whereas if I had shown this picture to you September of 2020, children would have been about five to 6%. Now, overall, even including the first, second and third waves of the pandemic, children represent over 20% of cases. And while it's not a fair demographic breakdown, this is actually from the Health Canada website. They actually merged 20 years of life almost, and then everyone else is 10. So a little bit not fair that way. But if we want to think of children as a group, they are the most, the, the most common group so far to date infected with COVID-19 in Canada at 20%. When it comes back to hospitalized cases now, so the good news is, and this is the message that has been very clearly articulated, very few children actually get hospitalized with COVID-19. So 0.5% of all pediatric cases, as you can see, they represent only 2% of the hospitalizations, yet 20% of the cases. So clearly, the burden of disease in terms of hospitalization is not in children. But here's the but. So if you actually look um, at children and who requires an ICU admission in Canada, if you are admitted to hospital in your child, 11% of all children hospitalized are ultimately admitted to an ICU. I believe that's about twice as high as the estimate this group um, gave overall in the slide where I asked that question. And the other piece that's concerning is if you're admitted to an ICU, while the numbers are small, only 16 deaths in Canada, 8% of children admitted to an ICU in Canada with COVID-19 have died. So it's kind of an ignored stat. And I think this is the piece of some kids do get sick. If they get sick, they get very sick. And if they get sick enough to require ICU admission, there unfortunately is a reasonably high mortality rate, not as high as in the adults still, but from the pediatric perspective, there aren't many illnesses that have a 10% mortality rate in children admitted to intensive care unit. So quite concerning when you get very sick. And this is kind of an important piece that we, we neglect to mention when we talk about severity of illness in children. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about children and their symptoms. So their symptoms are different than adults. This is a study published in JAMA Pediatrics about a month ago. It was a cohort outpatient study in Washington state. And what they did was they actually presented a couple things in this table. The first is they compared a long list of symptoms here on the left to those in adults. So they had 432 adults and two groups of children for 123 children in total. And pretty much the symptom complexes were different. Almost every single one was different between the children and the adults. Almost all of them, if you look at the adults, um, the proportions are more common than those in the children, um, except for the asymptomatic group. So they had a no symptoms group, which as you can see was 46% of kids under four, 33% of those five to 17, but just 7% of adults were asymptomatic. The five to 17 year old group was a bit closer in symptoms to the adult group. Not surprisingly, as you transition through adolescence, teenage years and into adulthood, the symptom complex has become more similar, but not quite the same. So if you look even, for example, fever, 20% of kids versus 40% of adults, cough, 16% versus 58%. So really children and their symptom complexes when infected with COVID are very different than what we see with adults. The other thing to note and what they, what they, um, what they uh, showed here is the number of symptoms on the y-axis. Each dot represent a child, a case or an individual, an adult in, in orange or, or brown. Um, and what you can see is as you get older, um, and this is kind of the, the smoothing line, the highest number of symptoms occurs in the 30 to 40 year old range where they have five to six symptoms uh, commonly, that's kind of the median there. Whereas in children, particularly the young ones, the five to seven year olds, the, the, the um, uh, elementary school kids, zero to one symptoms. As you get into high school, you're now talking two to three symptoms. So a little bit more, but clearly kids are much less symptomatic when they have COVID infection than adults. So this was a really nice study just published uh, last week in CMAJ by a Canadian group that looked at the characteristics of children admitted to hospital with SARS-CoV-2 infection. So this study was done by using the Canadian Pediatric Surveillance Program. Um, and this is an infrastructure that includes 2,800 pediatricians who report cases um, voluntarily um, through an online tool. And they were attempting to look, collect data related to all kids admitted to hospital with SARS-CoV-2 infection between April and December, 2020. So about an eight month time period. So what they found was they 264 cases were analyzed. Only 150 of these were admitted because of COVID-19. And then when you look a little bit further, 
63 of these, so almost half of them were under a year of age, so a predominance of young children, but very few of them had severe illness. So the vast majority had mild to moderate illness, so about 70% were moderate, mild to moderate illness, and only about 30% had severe or critical illness. And even then, the definition of severe illness was respiratory distress or requiring supplemental oxygen, which could also just mean low flow oxygen or nasal prongs. So not necessarily what many clinicians would call severe or critical. Um, their critical illness was more, more ill, obviously requiring admission to ICU, ventilation, or shock or organ involvement. Um, when you looked at the severe illness and the critical illness groups, the older kids, which is quite different than most viruses in children, kids 1 to 18 were much more likely to have severe illness or critical illness compared to that infant cohort, which is a little bit unusual because when it comes to respiratory viruses, that's the group that is usually most unwell. And when you actually even look a little further, of the kids admitted to ICU, only 10% of the infants under one year of age, but 30% of those aged one to 18. They obviously grouped a large group of the kids together where there's probably a lot of variability between a one and a half year old and a 17 year old um, in this study. So because of some of the limitations and the challenges recruiting large numbers of kids, so as you can see in that Canadian cohort, there were very few kids who were critically unwell. One of the early initiatives that I was involved with was partnering with Pediatric Emergency Research Networks, which is a network of networks. So it includes um, seven pediatric emergency medicine research networks around the globe. PERC is one, um, the one from Canada that I used to be on the past chair of. Um, but we work closely with many of these other networks on other collaborations. And we include over 100 hospitals globally um, and over a million visits uh, to pediatric emergency departments per year, which gives us the ability to enroll larger numbers of children in clinical research studies. So what we did is we early on in this in the pandemic, we actually moved forward and launched what we call the PERN COVID-19 study, which included 41 sites in 11 countries. Um, the mod, the countries that were most able to do it, Europe actually was very was oops, sorry was struggling quite a bit in the early days of the pandemic with the wave of the, uh, the first wave. So there were very few sites that were willing and able to participate at that point in time. Australia, New Zealand was willing and able to, but they had very few cases in the early days, which was a challenge. Um, the U.S. and Canada are where the predominant of enrollment occurred, as well as a site in Costa Rica and two in South America. What we did in this study is we prospectively recruited children who were tested for SARS-CoV-2 in emergency departments, and we enrolled both positive cases as well as negative controls. We targeted enrolling 12,500 children with approximately one third of cases, one third of children enrolled being cases. And everything was done prospectively, blinded essentially to the test uh, result. So we enrolled them after they presented to the emergency department and actually, especially in the early days, getting a test result and sometimes still in, in certain locations in Canada, it takes up to 24, 48 hours to get a test result. We would enroll them um, and could get consent prior to the result. We'd collect data related to epidemiologic risk factors, demographics, symptoms, laboratory tests performed medical visits that they have in the subsequent 14 days. And then we did a medical record review to collect any um, adverse outcomes and severe outcome data. And then we did a follow-up phone call at 90 days as well to collect long-term outcome data. So in this study, um, we, which enrolled kids between March 2020 and June 15th of 2021, we enrolled 3,200 children who are SARS-CoV-2 positive, of whom 21% were hospitalized. And overall, we had, um, of that hospitalized group, 95 children had severe outcomes, and I'll come back to that definition, or 14%. And 12 of the kids that were initially discharged from the emergency department ultimately went on to have severe outcomes, or 0.5%. Overall, four children died. Um, when you look at the kids who were SARS-CoV-2 negative, actually 25% were hospitalized. So we actually, I should say, we enrolled 7,100 children, so about twice as many. 25% were hospitalized. Of these, 10% had severe outcomes. And of the kids who were discharged from the emergency department, 0.2% had severe outcomes. So we defined severe outcome a little bit more. We decided ICU admission by itself 
especially less than 48 hours, doesn't necessarily represent a severe outcome. And the reason for that was something we were learning quickly from our European colleagues, is that many young children were being admitted to ICUs in Europe simply for monitoring because nobody knew the impact that COVID was going to have on children who are one, two, three, four months of age. And so just relying on ICU admission alone wasn't sufficient to justify qualifying it as a severe outcome. So we required evidence of a complication, and we kind of broke them into different categories of cardiac, infectious, neurologic, respiratory, or death, obviously, or evidence of a real significant intervention, including chest drainage, ECMO, inotropic support, positive pressure ventilation, or need for uh, renal replacement therapy. So when you looked at our cohort amongst the SARS-CoV-2 positive children, and we looked at hospitalization risk, um, which something, an interesting trend that's played out is the risk seems to be high in year one, dropping in years two to five in many different cohorts, and then rising again when you get into the teenage years up to about 27%. When we look at ICU admission and severe outcomes in children, um, the lowest risk once again is in the less than one year group slowly increasing across the ages through one to two and peaking really once again after you hit 10 years of age. There is a close correlation obviously between ICU admission in red um, and severe outcomes in, in brownish orange. When we did a regression model, so we had sufficient outcomes to include a regression model with a certain number of risk factors and we found certain things of interest. The first is that, and actually of interest to Canadians, is that Canada, being in Canada and having SARS-CoV-2 was protective against having a severe outcome. Um, I have some theories about that. We did enroll in Canada. We had in the first, second, and third ways. Risk. Um, we, we tested a lot of children in Canada relative to other countries, and we enrolled a lot of children, probably presumably who had somewhat milder illness, um, and we couldn't adjust for all those features in our model. On the other hand, being in Costa Rica had an increased risk of a severe outcome. When we looked across the age spectrum, what we see is essentially when you get into the 5 to 10 year and 10 to 18 year risk uh, age range, you have an increased risk of a severe outcome, as well if you had a chronic disease, previous episode of pneumonia. And the other thing that's of interest that actually correlates with some of the findings in the adult sphere is that if you're sick for four to seven days, so more days of illness has a greater risk of a severe outcome. Um, it wasn't statistically significant with greater than equal to eight days, but that likely reflects our smaller sample size and number of events in that group of children. But if you look kind of, it is trending in that direction as well. Now, when we compare our severe outcomes amongst SARS-CoV-2 positive children to negative children, if we look over all the positive children in red, slightly higher. If you look in Canada though, the negative children were slightly more likely to have an adverse or severe outcome. Whereas in the United States, we actually found the same trend. But when we look amongst hospitalized children only, of note in the US, hospitalized children with SARS-CoV-2 were significantly more likely than children who were hospitalized with non-SARS-CoV-2 infection to have a severe outcome. And that was held true when we looked at children overall at all countries in the cohort. The difference in Canada did not achieve statistical significance amongst hospitalized children. So I'm going to move into talking now a little bit about long COVID um, and some of its impacts on children. So we, in our study, we included children enrolled through January, 20, January 20th, 2021 to date. We defined um, uh, long COVID as persistent new or returning symptoms or health problems, and it's based on caregiver report at 90 days. And so one of the challenges with all of the definitions of long COVID is similar to the question I asked you before, many people might report certain symptoms within the last period of time at any given point in time. And let's say I had COVID nine months, three months ago, and I tell you the last week I've been fatigued. Is that a new symptom? And does that make it into reporting as long COVID? And then why is it a new symptom? So the, most of these surveys, including ours, don't tease out the etiology or justification or why someone or how strongly a symptom is correlated with long COVID. Having said that, that caveat, um, you know, what we did do in our study was we matched um, children, 474 hospitalized children, as well as 1,600 non-hospitalized children to, who were positive and negative based on hospitalization, country, and seasonality. And what we did then in this kind of table, what I show you is admitted SARS-CoV-2 positive children in red, discharged positive children in, yeah, in orange, admitted in kind of brown and discharged negative in green. So your admitted are the first and the third boxes. Um, sorry, admitted are your first and second, and your 
positive are first and third, if you think about it that way. What you can see is all children, when we looked at long COVID or post-COVID condition at 90 days, 10% amongst admitted positive, 5% amongst admitted negative, 4% among discharge positive, and about 2.5% amongst discharge negative. So really the risk is highest if you're admitted positive, followed by admitted negative, followed by discharge positive, discharge negative. So when you look across the spectrum, the real places where we find significant um, events are overall, when you compare admitted positive to negative, discharge positive to negative. So the positives are always more likely than the negative to report symptoms. When we looked at discharge positive to discharge negative in the five to 10 year olds, that was statistically significant. And the biggest difference was, one, uh, was among the admitted positive compared to the admitted negative. So 20% of children who are hospitalized who are SARS-CoV-2 positive reported long COVID symptoms. And then when we look at the number of symptoms they report, much higher that they report seven or more uh, post-COVID symptoms at 90 days if they had seven or more symptoms at baseline. So this is the number of symptoms at baseline with respect to reporting post-COVID condition. So the more symptoms at baseline, the more likely you are to report the post-COVID condition. And what really stands out are amongst admitted positive kids in both the four to six, as well as the seven or more symptom brackets. Um, we also looked at severe outcomes. If children had severe outcomes, they were, they were way more likely, dramatically so, to report post-COVID condition. And the difference here is about 17% um, to about 2% amongst those who did not report severe outcomes. Sorry. Let me rephrase this one. This is severe outcomes amongst SARS-CoV-2 positive children to severe outcomes amongst SARS-CoV-2 negative children. So if you have a severe outcome, you're SARS-CoV-2 positive, you are about seven times more likely to report post-COVID condition. So we also ran a multivariable uh, model and we included several covariates as I highlight here to see if SARS-CoV-2 infection in and of itself was associated with long COVID or the reporting of any persistent newer returning health problems. And indeed it was with an adjusted odds ratio of 1.66. So even in the absence or adjusting for hospitalization, number of symptoms at baseline, age, sex, country of enrollment, we found it was signif significantly associated with a long COVID condition in children. We do have several studies ongoing, but in the interest of time, I won't go into them, but we are looking at household transmission dynamics in this kind of similar study design, except that's a true case control study. We actually have a pan-Canadian study that's only looking at Canadian sites, enrolling more children and focusing on the Delta wave. And then the most recent study we're about to launch is looking at buccal swab testing using a point of care testing device to see if that can screen asymptomatically infected children and if, if it's amenable for doing performance at home by caregivers. So in conclusion, I think COVID-19 has highlighted how children differ from adults in many ways, but the fact that children can become critically ill is often an understated fact, although uncommon overall, if you do get sick and quite sick with COVID, your risk of having an adverse outcome is significant. The post-COVID condition does occur in children, and there are many ongoing pediatric studies, and hopefully these will help still fill some of the knowledge gaps that are crucial to our understanding of COVID-19 in kids. I'd like to thank all of our partners, as well as my many co-PIs and our leadership group for this study, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Freeman. Amazing presentation, and we have lots of questions in the chat box. Um, would it be possible if we go over a couple of minutes of 4.30 if, to answer most of the questions? Great. So let's start with the first one um, we have here. Uh, what are some strategies that have been effective or could have been effective in helping children comply with public health measures who may experience lockdown fatigue in um, the first one to five years into the pandemic, what role can parents care or caregivers play in, in encouraging adherence? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, there's a bunch of questions in there, I think, but I, I think we are all experiencing pandemic fatigue. I think that is a real thing. Well, I'm, I'm tired of putting on my mask and wearing it for eight hours in the emergency department all day. Um, we're all tired of it. Um, I think the, you know, I think actually the one to five are the easier group than the teenager group. Um, you know, I think where where complying with parental request and role modeling is a little bit harder almost. And I think that's where there's a lot of transmission, especially where they're not being monitored outside of school. 
you know, where their the social need is immense and actually important and cannot be understated. So one of the most important things, actually, I think um, I'm de deviating a little bit, um, is that we need to keep schools open. We need to keep schools engaged um, and in preventing that. So we really need to have schools and caregivers reinforce these public health measures, both at school and at home and beyond, so that kids stay in school. We don't have more lockdowns because the mental health is another pandemic that I haven't talked about. But I can tell you right now, I'm going to an emergency shift and about a third of our beds in the emergency department here in Calgary are full of children with ingestion, suicidal attempts and suicidal ideation and violent behavior. Um, and it is a huge pandemic that's being under, um, underestimated. Um, but in the one to five year old group, I think the best thing that we can do is role model and be consistent. Um, you know, the kids, kids view positive role modeling. You know, they see us wearing our masks, us hand sanitizing. If we're not having our friends over in the house and we're, you know, we're complying with recommendations and every province defers a little bit right now, but really, we, if we don't want them to hang out with their friends without masks on in the house, we can't hang out with our friends without masks on in the house. house. And even beyond that, we need to kind of go above and beyond. So I think, you know, to, to wrap that question up, I think it's role modeling is the biggest thing that we can do and consistent messaging and the yo-yoing that some we have seen in some provinces is very hard, where all of a sudden we're life is normal. Now we can't do anything and life is normal. We can't do anything. They have trouble understanding that, I think. But I think with the proper messaging, kids can comply quite well, I think. Yes. And our, our next question here is, if children's symptoms, uh, complex, uh, symptom complexes are different than adults, then what should we be looking for in infected children? Ch children are sneaky, um, unfortunately, or SARS-CoV-2 infection in children is sneaky, and that's the problem. Um, and that's why, um, you know, I, I think to focus on one symptom is, as you saw in that earlier slide, um, although I did go through quickly, there's no one symptoms that's going to capture all of them. So children with SARS-CoV-2 infection are going to have lots of very mild symptoms is the most common thing. Um, and we need to, that's why, I mean, I've been a huge advocate um, of ongoing masking all kids, regardless of age, in public environments, in areas, especially, I'm in Alberta right now, so yeah, where, where COVID is rampant. And the only way to curtail its spread in those groups and then keep kids in preschool daycare is to use the public health measures we know are highly effective. That's why so few kids got sick in 2020. It's because public health measures prevented spreading kids. The other thing that I'm seeing a lot of, which is very concerning, is I see kids in the emergency department all the time who have been going to daycare and school with the symptoms that are on this list, um, and including fever, runny nose, cough, new onset stuff. So, so there is no single symptom that would identify a kid with COVID. And there's actually a good study from Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario showing that. So any of these symptoms really, from my playbook, require testing. And the one thing that, you know, what there's a study that the UK, for example, really predicated testing on adult symptoms of anosmia. Those don't show up in kids. Um, I don't even know where it is on this one. So loss of smell, taste. Here you go. Almost no kids get it. Um, so you can't rely on those symptoms. We need very broad generic testing and um, ac ready access to it to be able to screen kids, keep kids who are sick out of milieus where they can spread it to others. And that is crucial to keeping the schools open. Thanks so much. And the next question here we have is, what's the comorbidity um, of the children hospitalized, admitted in ICU and died? You know, I can't, I can't disclose the details of the four cases. Actually, I'll confess I don't know them either, and um, I haven't focused on them too, too much. Um, I don't really have the data on the comorbidities in general, where I talk about comorbidity being a risk factor. I don't have that data in a manner that I can, on the tip of my tongue, to share with you, unfortunately, at the moment. But good question. It's something we're going to be diving into a little bit when we look at that data. And our next question here we I, have... Sorry, I'll just add, I will oh. add, I, I believe in the Canadian study for, in CMAJ, um, and one of the things that I have seen and other groups have reported is neurologic conditions, underlying neurologic conditions, um, which can be a broad grab bag in kids, you know, from cerebral palsy, palsy to seizure disorders, um, to, you know, children who have significant aspiration risk factors, et cetera. So it's not necessarily a kid who goes to school who's got a seizure disorder. It might be a child who's got a trach tracheostomy who's ventilated at night at home on an ongoing basis. And I don't have those details, unfortunately, for you. 
And our next one here is, I've heard some doctors advocating for letting COVID be a childhood illness and only vaccinating those who are at high risk of being hospitalized. What are your thoughts on that approach? Um, you know, I'm not going to go too far on it, except to say that I think that's an extreme uh, group. And actually, many medical associations, including in Alberta, are, are not really allowing people uh, or encouraging that message. Um, it is really not founded solidly and uh, doesn't have a strong foundation. There are a couple things I'll mention about, you know, COVID. And so we talked about the severe outcomes a little bit. The other thing I didn't talk about is MIS-C, multi-system inflammatory syndrome of children. So incidents of 130, 100 children who get COVID get multi-system inflammatory syndrome. 50 to 60% of those kids end up in an intensive care unit. We do not want kids to get MIS-C. They can get coronary artery aneurysms. They are very sick. They come in in shock um, and they actually have a reasonably high mortality rate overall as well. Um, there's long COVID, which I talked about, a little bit hard to still decipher, but all the studies are pointing to, towards kids with COVID having more complaints at 90 days or other periods of time compared to kids who are negative. Could there be a reporting bias? Are there some concerns? Possibly, but I don't think at this point in time, we should say that it's a disease that we should allow widespread um, transmission. The other is even, you know, there's a good study from the CDC showing the risk of myocarditis from COVID itself is a lot higher, dramatically higher than the risk of myocarditis from the vaccine. And I'm speaking actually literally, I'll be honest with this group, as a parent of a child who had the one ten thousand, and actually my child had myocarditis, was hospitalized from the vaccine, and actually right now is in our cardiology clinic getting a stress test because he is recovering from it, I would still advocate for the vaccine. Thanks for sharing. And the, the next one we hear, it's it's more of like a, um, uh, just a remark and see if you have any thoughts on this. This week, I've seen three very different symptoms lists for adults, which appear to conflate symptoms of wild type with symptoms of Delta variant. They're not the same symptoms. How about building an infographic showing symptoms of, of uh, sorry, symptoms, symptoms for Delta variant in adults versus children? I think this would be so helpful. Your uh, thoughts. Great. Great point. Actually, the the study that um, that I just mentioned uh, here, the last one about the Canadian study, we actually have a lot of da data on the Delta variant. To date, I've actually only seen one study published about, I think it was 35 kids with Delta variant from England um, in Lancet uh, Pediatrics Child and Adolescent Health. And there's not a lot of data. We actually, the study uh, here, the Pan-Canadian Pediatric Cohort, is collecting data and we actually have a large prospective database on kids with Delta and we are just um, about to start analyzing that and hope to share the symptoms and see if they are different than the other variants and different than adults. So it's a, a great point and uh, thanks for raising that. Okay, we'll try to get through maybe one more or two questions because uh, we're a little bit over. Uh, the next one here we have, what about the pre-morbid conditions of the children recruited in your study? Um, that might have been uh, a question from your slide, post-COVID conditions, 90 days. Um, uh, I'm not sure what you're referring to. Um, in, yeah, sorry, I apologize. I'm not sure what the question is referring to. I kind of answered a little bit about underlying comorbid conditions in kids with severe outcomes. Um, there actually is not, I, I do have some data on this, but I, I didn't present it today. Um, so I'm gonna stay away from that at the moment as, well, as far as related to underlying comorbid conditions. Keeping in mind, that's a very big grab bag and that's why it's a tough one to, under, to analyze. It can include anything from asthma to, as I said, severe debilitating neurologic illness. Um, and they're not all one and the same. Okay. And I think this is a good question to end off here. Any differences in outcome for Delta infections compared to pre-Delta? So not, uh, not a lot. There have been two, two studies that have reported, and actually there was another one just in CMAJ today, of actually not pediatric specific, and I apologize, I, it, I haven't read it yet. It was um, by Dr. Fisman, um, showing uh, that the Delta variant, as well as some of the other variants, have higher morbidities uh, relative to the wild type and then the alpha and beta strains that, that followed. Um, there are two other studies that have shown Similarly, increased concerns related to adverse outcomes in kids associated with Delta. Um, one of them did not stratify at all by age group. It just gave an overall 
risk. And then it gave a portion of those kids, about 10% of them were children, which kind of so it hinted at that as well. Um, and the other study showed a small increased risk. So I think my impression, there's a small increased risk, odds ratio probably in the ballpark of 1.1 for a severe outcome. So not a big one. Um, it's everything else that is in there. And, you know, I wanted to wrap up on, and actually it's kind of, you know, I don't know why I'm wrapping up on this because I didn't talk about it, but for those who talk about, um, you know, widespread COVID, the mental health of our kids, the fear of COVID, the um, isolation, the impact of school closures is huge. And so we as a society, I believe, owe it to our kids to have COVID under control through our appropriate public health measures, which includes vaccination, et cetera, to keep our kids in school, allow them to have normal activities, whether it's hockey, skiing, lacrosse, soccer. Um, that is what our kids actually need because I think the biggest impact of this pandemic, we can talk about the acute illness, Miss C, um, post COVID condition, the mental health long term impact on our kids is irreparable. Um, and you can't go back and be a 12 year old again. Um, so we really need to make sure our kids um, can have as normal life as they can. And that can occur with mass public health measures, appropriate things being done. Um, and that is way better than being in lockdown situations where we've been and some of us continue to be on an ongoing rolling basis. So I think we need to do what we can um, as a community, as a healthcare community to advocate um, amongst our adult colleagues who are often the ones filling up the ICU beds um, and causing a lot of the challenges in our society to get vaccinated and adhere to public health measures. Thank you so much, Dr. Freeman. And I just want to take the opportunity now on behalf of the Can COVID team to extend our thanks uh, for this fantastic uh, presentation and very engaging one too. You see lots of uh, many thanks in the chat box there from our attendees as well. And of course, thank you to all our attendees for joining today. Um, just a few announcements quickly. Uh, next week's speaker series is on Tuesday from 4 to 4.30 Eastern Daylight Time, where we will hear from Drs. Graham Dickens, uh, Dixon and Bill Full. And the title of the presentation is Leadership During COVID-19. And again, details about all of our events are on our website and will be included in this week's newsletter. And be sure to subscribe to our weekly newsletter if you haven't already done so, so you can stay up to date uh, about our events and other initiatives. Thanks again, Dr. Freeman. And thanks again to all our attendees for joining. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Great questions. We would like to thank our speakers and members of our network for their continued support and participation in Canada's pandemic response. If you are interested in learning more about CanCOVID or joining our Pan-Canadian COVID-19 Research Network, please visit our website at www.cancovid.ca.